This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be about a sketch of the proof of the prime number theorem. So if we recall the prime number theorem says that the number of primes less than x is approximately x over log of x. In the previous lecture I gave some background to this and um, gave a rough overview of the proof. And what we're going to do is to go through the various steps of the proof mentioned in the previous lecture in a bit more detail. So as I said, the first main step is to show that zeta of s has no zeros if the real part of s is um, greater than or equal to 1. So when the real part of s is greater than 1, this follows very easily from Euler's um, infinite product, that this is the product over all primes of 1 over 1 minus p to the minus s, as I discussed in the previous lecture. So the problem is to show that it's got no zeros on the boundary of this region where, where the product converges. And um, the proof of this is quite short, but involves a rather clever idea, which is not at all obvious. And the clever idea is to look at this function. You take zeta of s minus 2it times zeta of s minus it to the 4 times zeta of s to the 6 times zeta of s plus it to the 4 times zeta of s plus 2it. And you may wonder where this, does this funny looking function come from? Well, um, the exponents come from binomial coefficients. So you recall that if we've got a number z, then z plus c to the minus 1 to the 4 is equal to z to the 4 plus 4z squared plus 6 plus 4z to the minus 2 plus z to the minus 4. So we have these exponents, these coefficients 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, which are appearing in the exponents 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So how do you use this? Well, we recall the infinite product for zeta of s, and if you take the logarithm of that, we find that the logarithm of zeta of s is sum over all n and all primes of p to the minus n s divided by n. We're just using the usual formula that the logarithm of 1 minus x is um, x over x minus x over, sorry, plus x over squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 and so on. So if we if we apply that to the product formula for zeta, we get this. And this means if we take the logarithm of this funny product of zeta functions, we get a sum over all p and n of p to minus n s times um, p to the i n t over 2 plus p to the minus i n t over 2 all to the power of 4 divided by n. Here we're using the fact that um, this thing here is p to the 2 i t plus 4 p to the i t plus 6 plus 4 p to the minus i t plus p to the minus 2 i t. And um, so all, all, all we're doing is substituting in the sum for zeta of s for each term of this product. And this expression looks like a bit of a mess, but it has one really nice property. You notice this is always greater than or equal to naught, 0 for t real, because um, um, this expression is a number plus its complex conjugate, so it's real, and the fourth power of that is real, and so on. Um, so this expression here, is always greater than or equal to zero. Well, if the logarithm of something is always greater than or equal to zero, then that something is always greater than or equal to one. So we've got this key inequality that this expression here is always at least one. That, that, that's that's um, um, why we write it down. Well, now let's look at it in a bit more detail. So we've got zeta of s minus two i t, times zeta of s minus i t, times zeta of s to the 4, times zeta of s to the 6, times zeta of s plus i t to the 4, times zeta of s plus 2 i t. Um, and this is greater than or equal to 1, and here we need the um, real part of s to be greater than 0, so, sorry, to be greater than 1, so that everything converges. Um, and now, let's, let, let, let's fix t and assume that zeta of 1 plus i t is 
equal to zero. And this implies zeta of one minus it is equal to zero because it's just the complex conjugate of zeta of one plus it. And now let's take a look at what happens at the point s equals one. So all of these become meromorphic functions. So at the point s equals one, this thing has a pole of order six. And zeta of s plus one plus it has a zero of order four. And this also has a zero of order four. Well, if we've got altogether, so this has a zero of order at least eight and a pole of order at most six. So altogether, this function has a zero of order at least two at s equals one. Well, this contradicts the fact that it's greater than or equal to one for um, s greater than one. I mean, if it, if it's at least one for, for s greater than one, it can't suddenly become zero at s equals one. So this is a contradiction. So zeta of one plus i t cannot be equal to zero. Um, so... Um, so that, that, that's the first step of the proof of the prime number theorem. Um, the next step is to prove Newman's Tauberian theorem, but I'm not actually going to do that because it involves a slightly tricky bit of complex analysis. So we're going on to step three, which is to show that the integral from one to infinity of psi of x minus x over x squared dx converges. Um, here we just recall that psi of x is the sum over n less than or equal to x of um, lambda of n, where lambda has the property that lambda of a power of a prime is equal to the logarithm of the prime and is zero otherwise, as I discussed in the in the previous lecture. And what we do to prove this is to we observe that um, the derivative of zeta of s over zeta of s, which we recall is equal to sum over n of lambda n over n to the s, um, is can also be written as sum over n of lambda n times the integral from n to infinity of s over x to the s dx by elementary calculus, which turns out to be s times the integral from 1 to infinity of psi of x over x to the s plus 1 dx. Um, and um, you, 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 using that formula for psi. Um, so we have zeta prime of s over zeta of s minus 1 over s minus 1 is equal to s times the integral from 1 to infinity of psi of x um, um, minus x over x to the s plus 1 dx. OK, and now we're going to apply Neumann's Tauberian theorem. And Neumann's Tauberian theorem says that if the integral from 1 to infinity of um, f of x times x to the minus s dx converges for the real part of s greater than 1, and if you can extend this to a holomorphic function with no um, to a holomorphic function for real with no poles for real part of s equal to 1, then it converges for s equals 1. Well, um, so if, if we take f of s to be psi of s minus x over x, then we see from this that this um, function here has no poles for the real part of s equal to 1, because we showed that zeta of s has no zeros for real part of s equals to 1. So Neumann's Tauberian theorem works for this and implies that this function converges for s equals 1, which shows that this integral converges, which is what we needed to show. Um, so um, now step 4, we want to show that psi of x is asymptotic to x. And this follows easily because if psi is a increasing function, so, so if psi of x is any increasing function, um, and the improper integral integral from zero to infinity of psi of um, u minus u um, over u squared du is um, 
uh, less than infinity, then this automatically implies that the psi is asymptotic to x. And the proof of this, suppose that um, psi of x is greater than lambda x for some x with lambda greater than 1. Then the integral from x to lambda x of psi of t minus t over t squared dt is going to be greater than the integral from x to lambda x of x lambda minus t over t squared dt, which is greater than with some constant k. So um, if the integral converges, um, this can't happen for arbitrarily many um, values of x, because then the integral will be bigger than k plus k plus k plus k plus k, plus k and so on. So, um, so this condition here can't happen for arbitrarily large values of x. So, so psi of x, um, so the, 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 the limb soup of psi of x over x is less than or equal to 1. Um, a similar argument shows that the limb inf of psi of x over x is greater than or equal to 1, which shows that the limit um, of psi of x over x as x tends to infinity is actually equal to 1, which is what we're trying to show, that psi of x is asymptotic to x. So this is a slightly tricky but piece of analysis, but really has nothing to do with number theory. It's, it's, it's just a theorem about arbitrary increasing functions. So now we've got psi of x is asymptotic to x, and from this, step 5 um, deduces the prime number theorem, which says that x over log of x is asymptotic to the number of primes less than x. And this follows easily from the following key, um, key step, which is that log of x is almost constant. Well, you probably don't think log of x is almost constant, because if you've seen graphs of log of x, it kind of looks a bit like that, and that is clearly not constant, nowhere near being constant. Well, that's because you haven't looked at a graph of log of x for really large values of x. So suppose I look at it at a really large scale. So here's naught and here's 10 to the 10. And here's naught and here's 10 to the 10. So what does the graph of log of x look like? Well, it looks like this. It's indistinguishable from the x-axis then, it's indistinguishable from the negative y-axis there, so it's got a very sharp bend in it. Um, well, that, that said that log of x is approximately zero, so I want to focus in a little bit more on it. So, so let's um, expand the scale of the y-axis a bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at naught, here's 10 to the 10, and here's naught, and, and here's let's just go up to 100. And then the graph of log of x looks something like this. Um, it's, it's very nearly log of 10 to the 10 for all values until you get very, very close to zero. That, that, that's because whenever you go um, down by a factor of e, log of x goes down by 1. Well, if we go down by, you know, two or three factors of e, we're, we're already down here, but that means that log of this number has only gone down very slightly by about 2 or 3 or something, so we hardly notice it. And the, the, the graph of log of x looks almost like something with a right angle in it, if you look at something on, on a very big scale. And you can see that um, what this is saying is that log of x, so if x is less than or equal to 10 to the 10, then log of x is approximately log of 10 to the 10, unless x is very small. So, so, so the logarithm of x is very close to being constant when, when x is very large. So um, now we've got psi x is asymptotic to x, and what's psi of x? Well, that's lambda of 2 plus lambda of 3 plus lambda of 4 and so on. And what's lambda of n? Well, lambda of p to the k is equal to log of p. So we've got a sum over primes. But we've also got a sum over prime powers. And now we notice that we can ignore prime powers. And that's because prime powers are pretty rare. So the number of what's the number of prime squares? P 
you know, two squared, three squared, five squared, up to p squared less than x. Well, it's going to be at most the square root of x because the, the, the number of squares less than x, whether or not they're prime squares, is going to be at most the square root of x. And similarly, the number of prime cubes is going to be at most the cube root of x. So the number of prime powers less than x is going to be at most the square root of x plus cube root of x plus fourth root of x and so on, up to plus um, some kth root of x where 2 to the k is equal to x because there's no need to go further than that. So, so, so k is going to be about log of x times some constant. So the number of prime powers less than x that aren't primes is going to be at most, you know, about log of x times x. And this will be very, so log of x times root of x, and this will be very much less than, than x divided by log of x. So we can ignore prime powers. And if we ignore prime powers, we see that psi of x is going to be about log of 2 plus log of 3 plus log of 5 and so on. And um, if since log of x um, is approximately, um, so, 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 so log of p is going to be approximately log of x when x is large, as long as p isn't too small. So this is going to be approximately um, log of x plus log of x and so on, where the number of terms here is just the number of primes less than x. So we see that psi of x, if we ignore prime powers and pretend log of x is constant, is going to be about um, log of x times pi of x. So um, since log since psi of x is asymptotic to x, this gives us that pi of x is going to be asymptotic to x over log of x. Um, so that ends the sketch of the proof of the prime number theorem. Um, if you want to see um, the details, um, I'm adding a link to a paper by Don Zagier, which um, um, in particular gives a proof of Newman's Tauberian theorem and um, gives a, 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 altogether his proof of the prime number theorem is only about four pages long. Okay, next lecture will be um, about the Dirichlet's theorem about prime numbers in arithmetic progression.